there may be additional preps that are valuable or valid to your particular situation, your skill level, your environment. Uh, so when adding to that baseline, what I like to do is just add what I call supplemental kits. Um, they're supplemental in that they supplement that baseline kit, but they're more situation dependent. They may not be something you need all the time, but it's something that you should have available if that situation applies to you. And one of the most prominent examples of that is probably the urban supplemental kit. The needs don't necessarily change from an urban to a rural environment, uh, from the city to the woodland. They don't necessarily change, but some of the resources available do change. So I think that there are some valuable supplements that you could add if you're in an urban environment and it applies to you. Uh, so when we're talking about fire, uh, and of course, you know, shelter and clothing choices, that, that really doesn't change. There's a lot of shelter in urban environments, uh, probably more so than readily available shelter, more so than there is in the rural environments, but, you know, the fuel resources are not quite the same. Uh, so I think that for an urban kit, one thing that I would want to add is some sort of stove with a, with a fuel source. Uh, and in this case, just a, uh, a can of isopropane. Uh, is one and the particular stove that I've had and been using for about I would say 15 to 20 years now is an MSR pocket rocket which is just a real small lightweight stove really effective used this for well over a decade maybe close to two by now uh, but it's still small and lightweight packable but because I expect in an urban environment to have not so much uh, as far as the fuel resources that are in, I would find in the woodlands, you know, this is a good idea to pack this as a supplement to your baseline. Then moving on to hydration, one thing that is probably available, especially on these large commercial buildings, is their external water spigots. On all these commercial buildings, if you have what's called a silcock key in your kit, then you can actually turn those on uh, and access that freshwater resource in a commercial building in an urban environment. So a, a simple silcock key is really invaluable in an urban situation. So that's one that I would recommend putting in your urban supplemental kit. And of course, in an urban environment, there's a lot more chances, I feel, when compared to a rural environment. There's a lot more chances for scavenging. Uh, so I think that some additional tools may benefit you in an urban environment uh, that can be used for a number of things and not just scavenging but also for mobility. Uh, I feel like there would be a lot more obstacles that you would have to get through uh, between chain link and wire, uh, things like that. So having different tools that I would never think about carrying in the woodland might be a good idea for you in your situation in an urban environment. Uh, a couple of those tools and these are kind of very similar so it I leave it up to you to decide which one you would want to choose, but you have like lineman's pliers. You know, so not only do you have the pliers, but they have some pretty robust wire cutters in there that you could snap through fences with uh, fairly easy, uh, and they have some pretty decent leverage depending on your grip strength. These are a little more dual purpose than the bolt cutters, but the bolt cutters, these are very, these are the smallest bolt cutters I can find, but these are you know, you have a better mechanical advantage with these. So if your grip strength maybe isn't what it uh, isn't quite as good, you might want to go with these over these. You might want to carry them both. Uh, that's up to you. Um, you could probably cut some small locks or some hasps that the lock is on with this. Uh, if you're into scavenging, just, you know, obviously do whatever your conscience allows you to do. But uh, those are some tools you might think about having. And another tool that I really like is kind of a mini crowbar. Uh, and this is kind of going along with the mobility and also the ability to scavenge, uh, but you know, to be able to pry doors, windows, uh, what have you. Having something really small like that is something that might be valuable for you. So if I were to put together an urban kit, I would probably choose two or three of these tools to add to that kit. Another thing I'll say is in an urban environment versus the rural is, you know, depending on the state of the city you're in uh, and what the catastrophe was, you know, there's a greater chance, I feel like there's a greater chance anyway for, for a lot of things like sharp metal, uh, a lot more hazardous dust in the air, uh, rebar, name it. So like personal protective equipment, like just a simple pair of gloves might be a good addition. You may even go as far as to have like some eye protection, maybe even a respirator. Uh, that It really depends on what you really think is going to happen then. And that probably would be a great idea to have stashed away somewhere. Uh, so 
if it were me and I lived in a city, which I don't, uh, this is what I would recommend and kind of why I would recommend it. So what I encourage you to do is just take some of these recommendations, think about them, how they would apply to your situation, whether it would help you or not, and decide for yourself if this is something you want to add as a supplement to your baseline kit, depending on where you live. Um, but like the baseline kit, keep in mind the needs that you're trying to provide for and decide you know, really what's different between you know, the woods and the city. Uh, and that should help you narrow down your list and come up with your own urban supplemental kit. But this would be my urban supplemental kit if I were to have one. Another supplemental kit that is really applicable to a lot of people because they live in areas that get really cold to where that baseline kit isn't enough is a cold weather supplemental kit. And I say it's supplemental because, you know, it's not always cold. Like I live up in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. It's cold for probably four to five months out of the year. But the other times it's, yeah, I can get away with just that bag. Um, so I'm not gonna pack this all the time and, and drag it around if I'm trying to get from point A to point B in the summertime, for example. That's just not something I'm gonna do. This would be staged in my vehicle. Uh, if I have access to that, it would be staged at home. It would be staged at my alternate bug-in location. It's not something I'm gonna carry all the time. But as we start getting closer to winter, I'm gonna switch out that baseline. I'm gonna kind of beef it up with insulating stuff. And of course, because insulating stuff is big and fluffy, you know, you kind of need a bigger bag. So I just moved to a larger Alice Ruck. Um, and then, you know, thinking about those needs again, fire doesn't change during the winter, uh, but my clothing choices change. So the first thing that I'm going to be using is some layered material. I've got a couple of different sets, uh, lightweight and heavyweight wool uh, long johns that I would put under my normal clothes, which I consider kind of my durable layer. And then of course a windproof waterproof layer that would be in there and hat scarf and gloves all wool that's just my preference uh, so that's kind of my upgrade to the clothing when we're talking about the core temperature control uh, fire doesn't really change uh, but as far as shelter items i can still get away with a poncho for my overhead cover but you know the poncho liner is not going to be insulative enough in really cold weather so I'd upgrade that to a three-part sleeping bag system, uh, which is basically the military sleeping bag system, the MSS, but I use kind of part of that in the Snug Pack Special Forces sleep system, uh, which consists of a pretty heavyweight bag with a lighter patrol bag that also zips inside of that bag to double it up and get even more insulation for cold weather. And this is a baffle that goes to that set that helps tie those all together. Uh, and then, you know, I go from that small bivy sack, even though I can get away with that, a lot of times I'll use a more robust, heavier weight Gore-Tex bivy sack to go with that. Uh, so if it's applicable, you have extreme cold weather like I do, you know, you need to supplement that stuff from that baseline. And I think that's an important point uh, to make. So moving on, you know, nothing changes as far as first aid. Uh, additional things that I would put in there as far as mobility and kind of part of the clothing uh, is a different pair of boots like these Solomon boots are Gore-Tex they're heavyweight I wear these in the winter time a lot of times but I don't wear them any other time you know I like a lighter weight boot for the uh, the other three seasons but in the winter time you know protecting your feet from cold weather is important so I have a, a heavier duty kind of more insulating pair of boots in this kit uh, and then last but not least is a pair of trail crampons. Um, you may be in a position or in a situation or an environment where, you know, having snowshoes in your supplemental kit is, is, is something that's appropriate. Uh, where I'm at, typically we get more of a wet snow that freezes at night. So I find that the crampon without the snowshoe is, is usually the most useful. I do, however, have snowshoes. Um, they're just not in this particular supplemental kit, uh, but I do have those available. So. If you live in an area with cold weather, understand that that baseline kit's not gonna be enough for the winter, at least, and you need to have something on standby. But again, this isn't something you need packed all the time. This is something that you supplement your baseline kit with when the weather demands that you do that uh, in the environment. And if you don't live in an area that has cold weather, then you don't need any of this. But that is a, a winter supplemental kit. But again, not on your back. It's pre-staged either at your house, at your vehicle, or at your alternate bug-in location. You only really bring it in and start applying it to you know your standby go bag whenever it's getting close to winter or it is winter.
When it comes to supplemental kits, I want you to just think of it as things that don't fit in the baseline that are not applicable to every situation. But they could be applicable to other situations, so you're preparing that stuff in advance so that you have it pre-staged on standby and it's there to supplement that baseline kit. And you're not limited to the urban supplemental kit or the cold weather supplemental kit that we've talked about before. You can, based on your plan, identify a lot of different contingencies that you may need to develop a supplemental kit for. A couple of those contingencies may be you want to have a more robust medical kit, a medical supplemental. And this is a full backpack of medical gear that's designed to supplement the IFAC that I carry in my baseline go bag. And I won't go into detail about everything that's in here because I already covered everything that's in here and how to use it on my wilderness medical film. So I recommend you check that out to get details on this. The point that I'm trying to make here is that, you know, if the IFAC isn't going to be enough or if you're traveling with a group or you want to have additional medical supplies at your alternate bug-in location or in your vehicle or in your home, then I would consider that a medical supplemental kit. And I think that's a great idea. This is an example of that. Another supplemental kit that I like to keep personally, and it may fit into your plan and it may be applicable to certain situations is what I call a camouflage supplemental kit. It's not a full blown tactical supplement. Uh, it has more to do with, with moving with some stealth and concealed and, and trying to hide better in a wilderness setting. Uh, camouflage patterns may not be applicable to your plan at all, but a camouflage pattern may be applicable if the majority of your movement includes moving through the forest uh, or moving through the wilderness, what, whatever type of wilderness you have in your environment. You know, it may be a good idea to think about, you know, not only the gray man principle where you're wearing civilian clothes and looking like the rest of the population, but when you're trying to not look like everyone else, you're trying to not be seen, trying not to be found, a camouflage pattern is an effective way to do that. And of course, you could also just choose neutral colored civilian clothing, which your browns and your tans and your, your olive and, uh, kind of your khaki colors blend really well in a number of different environments, but they don't necessarily break up patterns like a camouflage pattern does. So that, again, that's up to you. That's up to your plan and what your situation is and the contingencies that you're preparing these supplemental kits for. But at a minimum, I would recommend having a camouflage supplemental that includes, you know, just a set of camis, a set of a camouflage uniform uh, type of thing or your your hunting camo uh, you could use that as well any camouflage pattern that works well in your environment that you have tuck that away so you know where it is in case you need it you can grab it quickly put that in your supplemental kit uh, my particular supplemental kit just as a baseline i've got at least a pair of pants and a shirt a t-shirt and a boonie cap a jungle cap that really does well at, at breaking up the outline of my head. Uh, so that's my baseline that I would use for all the time travel through the forest if I wanted to be a little more concealed. That's kind of a baseline. At a minimum, this is what I would want. You can go all the way up to where you have either a partial or a full ghillie suit. Uh, you could have a viper hood. You could just use, you know, just the ghillie suit hat and break up a lot of your pattern. Uh, it really depends on your skill level, your training, your plan. You could have a complete full ghillie suit. What I will say though is, you know, having this by itself is not something I would ever do because I can get away with and get pretty close to pretty much anything with just this pattern on. I could probably do it with neutral colored, natural colored clothing as well. But there are situations I can think of where this would be extremely handy. Uh, but one thing I learned from being a sniper is that I don't want to put this on until I absolutely have to. This isn't something I'm going to wear uh, just walking around the forest. This is something I'm going to wear when I expect that somebody may be able to see me and I need a little additional help breaking up my pattern. Uh, I'm not going to wear this from point A to point B on a bug out uh, by any means, but it may be handy to have, you know, even if it's just in a vehicle supplemental kit uh, or a supplemental kit in my vehicle in my current location, my, my bug in location or my alternate bug in location. So something to think about if that fits your plan. Uh, this is what fits my plan and what I choose to carry. Uh, this is kind of my minimalist camouflage and this is kind of my maxim, maximum camouflage. Uh, and then you could also just do a viper hood if you wanted, which is kind of a more small, more, more uh, compact and packable version of this. It's up to you, it's up to your plan. But if you think these are something that's handy, if this is in the contingencies that you've thought of for you and your family, then I recommend you set these things aside or at least start preparing them now so that you can set them aside in the event that you do need them 
they'll be right there. You'll know exactly where they are and you'll know how to use it. We did that up there already. That was condensation, we it wasn't my that. fault. All right, so one other supplemental kit that is very important to my particular plan and kind of the long-term uh, situation, uh, and maybe even the short-term, is what I call the tactical supplemental. And, you know, depending on your plan and your skill level, uh, your level of training, you know, yours may not look exactly like mine, uh, but this is what mine looks like, all right? It's important to me to have a concealable inside the waistband type of system to carry a basic firearm, a basic pistol for personal defense. Uh, so I like the Stealth Gear USA inside the waistband. It's got a slim belt and this is designed to be concealed. And depending on which particular firearm I choose to carry, I've got a double magazine pouch as well as a single. Uh, really depends on, you know, uh, what I'm doing for that day and what I feel like I need to be carrying. So I like to have that option. Uh, but in the event that, you know, I feel like an outside the waistband system is better, uh, then, you know, I want to have that option as well. So I have that rig in there as well. Again, this is Stealth Gear USA also. Uh, it's just an outside the waistband version, double mag carrier and outside the waistband holster. So that's kind of a baseline for me uh, and whether or not I want to be concealed or not concealed. Uh, one thing with that is because this is a supplemental kit, the way it works within my system is I like to have the outside the waistband available uh, because a lot of people ask, you know, why don't you put a firearm in your bug out bag and, or your go bag? And to me, it doesn't belong inside the bag. If you're in a, in a situation where you feel like you may need a firearm, that needs to be readily available. So for me, it's either outside the waistband readily available or it's inside the waistband readily available, but more concealed. So I like to have those options. Uh, so that's kind of the baseline for me. And I also like to have other options for different situations as well. So for a general kind of tactical rig that I would be using just if I was moving through the wood line or patrolling, uh, I'm gonna use something very simple, more, more suited to like, uh, like the web gear, the old web gear of the military. Uh, so. I like this UW chest rig from Mayflower Industries. Uh, I used this in Afghanistan and it was a really solid piece of kit that worked really well in conjunction with body armor. Uh, so I think this is a really good one that you can use for just normal patrolling, normal walking through the woods where it's not really appropriate to have a plate carrier and body armor and all that. And then that level of personal protection may not even be part of your tactical plan. So this is a good baseline way to carry some additional magazines. Uh, the GB2 IFAC fits in here with the supplements on the side. I've got a Spartan Blades CQB transition tool right here that's readily available. Uh, if you have training and that's part of your plan, then that's a good thing to have in there as well. That's just what's in mind. Uh, my communications in here, if I'm traveling with a group, uh, I need to get a hold of someone. A simple you know, Rhino GPS. I don't really use it for the GPS function so much as I use it for the two-way radio function. It's not really long distance, uh, but it's a good way to communicate. So whatever your particular communications plan is with your particular community and group, that's what you should go with. But that's what I have in there. A few additional magazines, and it's just a really lightweight, small rig that I can put, you know, in a supplemental kit for those times when this type of a rig is necessary. Uh, so that's what that's for. You can take it another step up if you want and it fits your plan. And depending on your local laws, regulations, you've still got to follow that to even possess and have these. Uh, but, you know, there are certain scenarios where the rule of law kind of breaks down and that no longer matters. So, you know, let your conscience be your guide on that. But this is the plate carrier with armor, body armor that I carried uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan as well. I still like it, it's extremely comfortable. This is the pig system, patrol incident gear, the pig system, uh, magazine carriers, place for my comms, and then of course I'd put my IFAC on this side. But again, depends on your particular situation, your plan, your training, your skill level, and what you feel like you need to supplement and do have the ability to do kind of tactical things, if you will. Um, you could even go as far as to, you know, have a helmet if you think that's something that, that fits in your plan. Uh, this particular helmet has a mount for night vision. 
It has hearing protection built in that works with some comms, uh, but I typically don't like to wear a helmet. I just have one available in case I need one. So plan out your own tactical supplemental kit, make it suit your plan, your skill level, and uh, your needs. But this is definitely a supplemental kit. It's not something that should be in your baseline. You don't need body armor to run to leave the coast if a hurricane's coming in or run to a safe location because the tornado's coming in. It's not always appropriate to have guns and body armor and all this other stuff. Have it available for other situations, that's a different story. But for me, this is a supplemental kit that I would include with my, within my larger system for those times when I do need it. 